my my guitar, my technique is very, very... I mean, you got five minutes, I will tell you everything I know. <laughs> well, we just heard the sad news that Wilco Johnson, the Dr. Feelgood guitarist in the 1970s, has just died aged 75. I worked with Wilco quite a lot back in the um, 1980s, 90s, and up to about 2008. Eight, I think it was. I'll tell you all about that. Well, not all about it, because I think we should keep some things a bit secret, but I'll tell you most of it, including things I've never told anybody in this short video. Wilco wasn't doing it very well when I met him back in, it was probably about 82, 1982. I was running an agency. We had people like Reckless Eric, who was playing with the Len Bright combo. and people like that. To cut a long story short, someone else I knew was getting work for Wilco Johnson and other people. He came to my agency and I took over working on Wilco when he left. And so we got to quite close, well, very close, especially with his wife, Irene, who was the one, the brains of the operation, if you like. Now, Wilco was a very intelligent guy. He's the only person who's been able to explain Einstein's theory of relativity to me so I can understand it. And the last time he did that was coming back in a van down the M1 as the sun was shining as we were coming into London, which somehow seemed to add a whole new dimension to his explanation. Then we stopped off at the services, I think it was the Blue Boar, and had some horrible breakfast, but it was quite nice. And um, I remember that to this day, though don't ask me what year it was. It was definitely, maybe the 90s, I don't know. So anyway, we went on tours together. I organized Tours of Ireland for Wilco. It was a very interesting thing, because back in the 1980s, when I was doing these tours in Ireland, British bands didn't really go over there much, because it was all run by an agency in Ireland who basically picked and choose who they want, and they didn't pay very well. They basically would pay an act X hundred pounds, and then they'd put it into a big venue and get lots of money. I went over there, and I met somebody, and they, sort of um, said I should go over and bring over the bands I'm working with in England and Scotland, Wales, etc. in the Republic of Ireland. And even harder, because there was the troubles at the time in the north of Ireland. So Wilco was, I think, the first one I took over there. We did about four tours, I think, of Ireland, 10 days here and there. They were very eventful. <laughs> I mean, we certainly bonded. We had so many things go wrong, and I must do a video about what happened on those tours. Vans broke down, then we spent every penny that we had, literally, getting the van mended, so we couldn't afford to check out the hotel. So we have to do gigs like hundreds of miles away. And back in those days, the Irish roads were not like they are now. It was like country lanes were the main roads. Anyway, the whole thing was just a complete fiasco. You'd probably have four days doing really well, getting lots of money, and then you'd have one thing that would be horrible, and then all the money would go. So at the end of every tour, I always ended up by the losing or not making anything. They didn't make much and they moaned about it all the time, the band, which at the time was Wilco Johnson, Norman Watray, and Salvatore Ramundo, who was this guy from South End. His family were into ice cream, and apparently he was genuinely Italian, who didn't speak any English till the age of 12. And he must have been, what, mid 20s in those days? And you would never have guessed he was like, you know, one of the funniest people and a great drummer. That's Salvatore Ramundo. I will Wilco off and on from those days. Um, I stopped being an agent. I was just putting on shows. I put Wilco on many, many shows at the Cricketers, at the Roby, at the 100 Club, at the Borderline, all over the place. Wilco's wife was Irene, his childhood sweetheart, and um, basically the love of his life. I got on very well with Irene, and uh, unfortunately she died in 2004. Before then, she was the person who really who looked after Wilco. She booked all these gigs, she basically ran the house, she looked after the children, she did everything, basically, and uh, Wilco just went out and played, basically, in every sense of the word. <laughs> It was a very moving funeral in the middle of the Essex woods and she, she was given a wild burial, very moving. When Irene died, Wilco just went to pieces really. It turned out he didn't know where any of his money was. He didn't know how to write out a check. I, for some reason in his autobiography, I have been erased. <laughs> I am nowhere to be seen. And a lot of things that I was doing, like I had to, t I had to go to Southend to teach him 
how to write out checks and how banks are things. And I took him to the bank and things like that. So we could sort out his finances, which all that's been wiped off. So well, I suppose he was embarrassed about it. I mean, to be honest here, Irene used to do everything for him. I mean, he didn't, he was very clueless on so many things. I mean, never mind a cooking. I mean, there's no chance he could even boil an egg or anything like that. It was like, it was like, he just, I don't know, he was one of the most in intelligent people I've ever met in my life. But when it came to like practical things like um, survival and life, he was absolutely clueless. Obviously, once Irene had died, he had to um, take the ball by horns, as it were, and um, get to know how to do things. But he still, I mean, even up to his death, had people who were looking after him, basically. So, I mean, I mean, he was a fantastic guitarist. He basically learned to play the style he did, which was, which was basically playing, you know, without a pick. And he used to pluck with his left hand. It's, anyway, I, I'm, not, I'm not even gonna try and ex explain how to do it because he, he explained to me so many times. And what it was, he started because he heard Mick Green of the Pirates. Playing in the same kind of style and he wanted to play like that. And he developed his own way of of playing, which when he met Mick Green afterwards, found out that his way was totally unique and nothing like what Mick Green did. So that's very strange. And he was innovating Dr. Feelgood. His songs were like their best songs, basically. And then they kicked him out in 1976. The version in the book, to be honest here, is slightly different to the version he told me, but there's a lot of things like that. We fell out rather badly. First of all, it was a gradual thing. When Irene died was the beginning of the end, I suppose, looking back on it. Julian Temple, the film director, made a film about Dr. Feelgood, and Wilco was the inadvertent star of that film. Boom, 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 all the time. Steam hammers, you know. And gradually this thing blows up over the horizon. Right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Canby Island. Because he's so ex eccentric and he's very charismatic, and he had the knack of saying the first thing that came in to his head, no matter how wild that may be, which, of course, is very endearing, especially when it's been cut down by a skillful director and editor. Wilco hit a certain level of fame, which he'd always miss since the Dr. Feelgood days. Because um, when he was with me playing these smaller stages in pubs and things, he never liked it. I mean, this is the thing. He, I mean, he used to tell people, oh yeah, I love playing in pubs, hated it. He wanted to be on a big stage, wanted to be famous, wanted lots of money. The wide wanted lots of money I never knew because he only spent it on stupid things like telescopes and the things like that. Because uh, he used to come back from Joe's. By his front door, he had this big urn. And he used to put all the money into that urn. There's lots and lots and lots. It was full of 20 and 50 pound notes. I think he liked the prestige of getting high paid gigs, but then he wouldn't spend it because he wasn't really a gourmet. I mean, when I met him, he barely drank. But of course, by the end, he was actually looking for the, the most expensive malt. Just as a, you know, like, if you're in a hotel bar, he would check out the most ex exclusive Scotch or Irish that they had in the bar. I was running gigs in the 100 Club and wherever, and he decided he didn't want to do those sort of gigs. And the minute he got this extra fame, he basically, said goodbye to all the people who helped him up to that point. And then when he got cancer and he was diagnosed, a lot of his fr friends, like people like me, who'd like known him before he came bigger, when he was doing this farewell tour, we remembered things like Ian Dewey doing his farewell tour and people like that. And it was very sad to watch because he was not up to how he was. It was like, just made people sad. And so we thought that we didn't want him going out there being ill thinking he needed to, because like the, the rumor was that he needed to do these tours to make some money to leave to his children. That was what the word on the street was, so we say. So a lot of these people got onto me because they thought that I was like um, closer to him than, than, than they were perhaps. And they got me to write to Wilco and um, basically saying, you know, have you thought about this? Remember Ian and all that? And I found out later from somebody I won't name them, who the minute he read that, he wiped me out of his life, basically, so there you go. 
And even to the extent when I put him on twice since then in Margate, the first time I was, I got a phone call from the agent saying that it's a bit, it's a bit embarrassing, Jim, but Wilco has asked me for you not to talk to him. If you want to do, if you, if you need to know anything, speak to a tour manager, which is a bit of a strange request. And then I accidentally bumped into him because I was backstage and I went past his dressing room door and he opened the door and he said, hello, Jim, and just, um, just slammed the door with me, so there you go. And then the second time, I don't think our paths crossed, so I stayed out of his way. I didn't particularly want to talk to him because even though he's dead and he's gone, he was, he could have been a cantankerous old sword. Yeah, Wil Wilco was Wilco. You know, he was one of a kind, one off, we'll never see his life again. And I am very sorry he's gone. Thank you for watching. And if you like this, please like and follow and subscribe and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.